Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and I'm going to start reading at verse 1 and read verses 1 through 7. And this is what it says. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. But to me it is a very small thing that I should be examined by you or any human court. In fact, I did not even examine myself. I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. Now, these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that in us you might learn not to exceed what is written, in order that no one of you might become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. For who regards you as superior? And what do you have that you did not receive? But if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Join with me in prayer. Jesus, this day, may our hearts be thankful and attentive to your word as, as you speak. May we have ears to hear. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. A woman went to her pastor, said, Pastor, can you help me? The pastor said, certainly, I'll help in any way I can. Then the woman said, it's my father. He's won $300 million in the lottery. Well, the pastor was a little confused, said, I don't understand how I can help you. She said, well, my father's 96 years old, and I'm afraid that if he hears that he, he won $300 million in the lottery, he'll have a heart attack. Well, the pastor didn't really appreciate being put in the position of telling her father that he had won the lottery, but he had said he would help, so... He said, okay, I'll go over and visit him and, and try and break it to him slowly. So he went over to the old man's house, and he tried to just, you know, make small talk a little bit. He said, well, you know, how about this weather? The old man said, yep, it's just like winter around here. You know, it's sun shining one day, and it's cold the next, and it's raining pretty much all the time. Well, they kind of laughed about that. So he thought, well, maybe... We can talk about the Super Bowl. Did you see the Super Bowl? And the old man said, yeah. He said, I was real fortunate I had the best seat in the house. He said, oh, you went to see the Super Bowl. He said, no, I had the best seat in the house. My chair, you're sitting in it right in front of the TV. Well, they both laughed about that and then they moved on. So he thought, well, maybe I've warmed up the subject enough where I can, 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 can broach it to the old man. He said, well, did you hear the pastor said, did you hear that the, the lottery got up to $300 million? The old man said, yeah, I heard that. The pastor said, well, what would you do if you won $300 million? 
And the old man thought about it. He said, you know, I'm 96 years old. If I won $300 million, I'd still be 96 years old. The pastor said, yeah, that's true enough. He said, you know, and I have arthritis. If I won $300 million, I'd still have arthritis. The pastor said, well, you've got a point there. He said, and if I had won $300 million, I think I'd just give it all to the church. That's when the pastor had a heart attack. <laughs> Well, the point of the story, you know, I, I like it because it starts one direction and it goes some direction you never thought it would. That it's going in a direction that turns the complete opposite direction on a dime. 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Two letters of Paul. And we think we would know exactly what this Paul, we think we'd know exactly the direction that these letters are going. Because things in Corinth, well, it, it was a whole lot like the Wild West. It was like Dodge City. That Corinth was established by the Roman government. The city was established to be a place, an, an outpost for army grunts. An outpost for those who were misfits and refugees and undesirables. And when Paul started a church there, well, it was the misfits and undesirables and the, the, those folks that kind of were the Wild West became a part of the church. And that's what started happening in church. Things that nobody would ever imagine would pop up in church were popping up there in Corinth. And just a cursory reading of 1 and 2 Corinthians. You see, I mean, who comes to church drunk? That's a rhetorical question. I'm not looking for hands. But who does that? Well, they did it in Corinth. And that was just the beginning. I mean, there are a whole lot worse than things. There. And, and the direction, knowing Corinth, you would think the direction that they're headed is that Paul would just start railing out on all these things they would do. And, and he'd read the riot act from beginning to end. But that's not what Paul does. Paul in chapter 1 calls them saints. Now, they're not acting like saints, but they're set aside called by God. Paul wants to make sure that they know that this is their identity. It's not how they're acting, but he doesn't start off with railing out against them. He starts off telling them their identity. And in chapter 1, he said, this is your identity. You're called. You're the saints of God. But then he says, but you all are, you're competitive against each other. You're acting like you're working against each other. And one says, well, I'm of Paul. And another says, I'm of Apollos. And another says, I'm of Cephas. And you start competing and, and breaking things apart. You're all called the saints. And then in chapter 2, he begins to tell them about the Spirit of God. In 1 Corinthians 2, 12, he says, Now you've received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God that you might know the, the things freely given to us by God, that, that you've got this, the power of the risen Christ living in you. Live like it. And he goes on in chapter 3 to say, not only that, but together, together, you're built up as the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? You're a, a holy place. This is who you are. This is who you are. He's, he's letting them know their identity. And then now, what we just read at the beginning of chapter 4, he uses another metaphor. He says, you're servants and stewards. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you, that leaves me kind of cold. Because the idea of a servant, to me, it draws a picture of somebody carrying around a tray that serves finger sandwiches and something to drink. And I thought certainly Paul means something more than somebody passing around finger sandwiches and something to drink. So I began to, to look up that word servant right there. And the word in Greek is huperitas. Huperitas. And huperitas doesn't have anything to do with finger sandwiches. What it has to do with is an oarsman. But not an oarsman in a rowboat that they're just rowing around by themselves. It's an oarsman on the bottom floor of a trireme ship. Well, how do you translate that? Well, the way the Bible translates it is a uh, servant. But that's not the whole story. 
that an oarsman on the bottom floor of a trireme ship is the one least likely to know the destination. The oarsman on the bottom floor of a trireme ship is the least one likely to know the danger. It's the oarsmen, along with hundreds of other oarsmen, that are to be side by side, shoulder to shoulder, pulling together and keeping their eye on the pilot. It's the pilot. It's the pilot that knows the destination. It's the pilot that knows the danger. It's the pilot that guides the ship. And they're to pull together, and we're to keep our eyes on Jesus. This is the, the and to trust him. Trust that he knows the destination, that he knows the danger, that he knows what's going on. So we pull together and we follow him. That's the metaphor. But right next to that, that metaphor of, a, of an oarsman is a metaphor of a steward. Well, that one leaves me kind of cold too. Because about the only place we hear about stewards nowadays is on cruise boats. And I really don't know what a steward does on a, a cruise boat. So I looked into that word too. And the word steward right here in Greek is oikonomos. It's where we get the word economy from. Economia is what it is. And, and, and it's two words put together. Oiko is house. Nomos are rules or law that the, the oikonomos is the one that knows the house rules, the house law. He's the one that the house doesn't belong to him. The farm doesn't belong to him. The family is not his family. He's a manager is what we call nowadays. He's the one that, that's responsible for the family getting everything that they need. He's responsible for the farm that the farm is, is run the way that the master intends it to be run. He knows the rules. He's the one that's in charge, making sure that the, the desires of the master, that the rules of the master are kept by everyone so that the family will flourish, so the family will flourish. Well, now we have these two. These two, the, the side by side that Paul launches chapter 4 with right here, a, a, a servant, an, an oarsman, and a steward, a, a manager. One is to trust the pilot and the other is trusted by the master. Trust and to be trusted. Well, a lot of times we don't think of the Christian life as, as we're trusted. We're, we're supposed to trust, yes, but to be trusted? Well, there they are, side by side. And Paul's telling this, the, the, this Wild West church, those that are living and off the hook life, that, that side by side you, you, you're to trust and be trusted. You're to pull together side by side, shoulder to shoulder, and you're also trusted. Well, what are they trusted with? Well, that's what he says right here in verse 1, with the mysteries. The mysteries of God. That's what it says in verse 1. Well, what are the mysteries of God? Well, that's what it hints at in verse 7. It says, and what do you have that you did not receive? The mysteries of God are, are the gifts of God's Spirit that are given to us freely. They're not things that we, we deserve, not things that we work for. They're the gifts of God. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. That we're trust. We trust in Jesus that those gifts have been given. And we're trusted to best use those gifts. With the mystery. We're trust. And we're trusted. And the first thing that I want to talk about, we're, we're trusted with unconditional love. I have a good friend named Bob. Bob and I, we were in four-year-old kindergarten together. We hit it off in four-year-old kindergarten, and we stayed best friends, good friends, all the way through elementary school, middle school. We were, played sports together, high school. Even in college, we'd get jobs together in the summer so we could do stuff together even after high school we still get in touch with each other 
cool. My friend Bob tells a story about when he was in first grade. And his first grade teacher wanted to get to know the students a little better. So she would ask each one of the students, says, well, what does your father do? Well, the first kid said, well, my father works at Lockheed. We lived in Marietta, and just about every kid's father looked, worked at Lockheed at the time. He asked the second, you know, my father works at Lockheed. He came around to Bob and said, what does your father do? Bob said, my father, he sleeps. <laughs> well, the teacher thought that was kind of funny. He said, she said, certainly he does something more than just sleep. And Bob thought about it for a minute. No, he sleeps. That's what my father does. He sleeps. Well, the teacher thought it was really funny, so when Bob's mother came to pick Bob up, she told his mom, said, yeah, I asked Bob what his father did, and he said, my father sleeps. Well, Bob's mother didn't think it was near as funny as the teacher did. She said, yes, Bob's father has three jobs, and he goes to school at night. <laughs> so when Bob sees him, he's sleeping. <laughs> well, from the, the point of view of a child, that makes sense. Because the child has a limited point of view. And very often it is when hard times come, when hardship comes, when suffering comes. When a time like this pandemic comes, we cry out, where is God? What is He doing? Doesn't He care? Is He sleeping? That's why Jesus Christ came. So God wouldn't stay a mystery. And Jesus came with an unconditional love that says that, that, that you matter to God. Hebrews 1, 3 says that Jesus is the, the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of His nature. We want to know where God is and what's He doing. Look to Jesus. Look to the Gospels. And where they're suffering, that, that's where Jesus was. You want to know where God is and what's He doing? Look to Jesus. Read it in the gospel where there's brokenness. He's there. Where is God and, and what's He doing? In celebration. He's there. He's right there in the middle of it. That, that's why Jesus came. So we would know we're not alone. So we would, we would trust him. We would keep our eyes on him like that pilot. We don't know the destination. We don't know the danger. And we fight in, in faith. We fight with our emotions. That's what faith is. Faith is, is that, that we, we, we know what we, what we see in Scripture. We know what, what we learn in church. But we fight with emotions that say, this can't be so. Maybe as a child you learn to, to swim, and a part of learning to swim is learning to float on your back. And there you can see everybody in the pool floating on their back, and you know that you, that you really can float on your back because you can see it out there. But the first time you go and you try and learn to float on your back, panic sets in, and you begin to fight with it, and the more you fight, the less you're able to float. Well, your head says, you know, I can float. I know I've seen it. But faith, faith trusts the instructor to hold you up until you're ready. To hold you up until you're ready. And that's what the Spirit of God does. It holds us up. It works in us. It's the power of the living Christ through you and through me. With an unconditional love that surrounds us. And we practice His presence by reading Scripture. We practice His presence by, by prayer. We practice His presence by worship. And we look to the pilot and we, we trust. But there's that second part too that we're trusted. That shoulder to shoulder, side by side, oarsman to oarsman, we lift one another up. Shoulder to shoulder, side by side, we encourage those around us, those who might not know that they, they matter to God, that He sent His only Son, Jesus, with an unconditional love that doesn't wait until you're good enough, until you've done the right things, that we're trusted with a message. 
to share. If ever there's a time that this world needs that message, the unconditional love of Jesus Christ, now's that time, and you're trusted with that message. Well, there it is, to trust and to be trusted with His unconditional love. But the second thing that I want to talk about this morning is not only His unconditional love, it's His unmerited grace. James Moore tells a story about a nurse, Sue Kidd. She was an ICU nurse and a a large downtown hospital. One of her patients was Mr. Williams. She was taking his vitals one day, and Mr. Williams asked, said, my daughter Janie is, is my only relative. Does she know that I'm in the hospital? Well, Nurse Kidd said, you haven't had any visitors. So that's when Mr. Williams said, I hate to trouble you, but could Could you call my daughter Janie and let her know I'm here in the hospital? She said, certainly. She pulled out a little pad of paper, and and Mr. Williams gave his daughter Jamie's phone number, and she wrote it on the pad. And then Mr. Williams said, could I have a piece of paper from that pad? She said, certainly. So she she gave him a piece of paper. Well, Nurse Kidd went on to, to, to visit the folks and rooms that she needed to to work with there and I see you and then she made the phone call well as soon as Janie answered the phone and nurse kid identified herself told her that her father was in the hospital that Janie began to cry and without asking she just volunteered this this story that she and her father had had an argument and it was over a boy and Janie had told her father She said, I hate you. It was over a year ago and hadn't spoke to her father since. So she cried out to Nurse Kidd. She said, he will be all right, won't he? Tell me, he will be all right. That's when Nurse Kidd said, well, we're working in that direction, but you do need to come visit him in the hospital if you'd like to see him. Well, Nurse Kidd went around to continue her rounds, and while she was in Mr. Williams' room, he had another heart attack well the team came in tried to revive him and they were unable to revive him and mr williams died that day a little while later his daughter janie showed up at the hospital she was outside icu and when nurse kid heard that she was there she stepped outside the the icu and told janie that her father had passed before she got to the hospital Janie asked if he could, she could see her father, and Nurse Kidd led her to his room there in ICU, and she fell on her father. She began to weep, and she couldn't hold back the tears. And that's when she said this. She said, I love you, Dad. I'm sorry. I don't hate you. I'm so sorry. That's when Nurse Kidd noticed that, that grabs in her father's hand was that piece of paper that Nurse Kidd had given her earlier. She, she took the paper from Mr. Williams' hand, and she saw at the top, it said, Dear Janie. She handed the note to Janie. She said, This is for you. And the note said, Dear Janie, I'm sorry about that night. I love you, and I know that you love me, and I know you don't hate me. All is forgiven. Before she asked, Before she confessed, she received forgiveness. And that's what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you and for me. Before we ask, before we confess, while we were still a long way off, while we were still at a great distance, He gave His life for you and for me that all would be forgiven. That before we had ever committed any sin, before we... We showed our weakness of faith before we were consumed in shame. Jesus gave his life on the cross for you and for me and said, all is forgiven. Before we did a thing, he said, all is forgiven. It's a mystery of faith. 
that unconditional grace and, and we're to look to him and trust that what he did on the cross, that it's enough. And that side by side, shoulder to shoulder, that we're to lean on him, we're to trust him. And that, that yes, it's enough for your sin and mine. Now, most often people don't receive that forgiveness until we confess it. So 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He not only forgives it, says, okay, okay but you, you're, you still have to live in this mess you made. He cleanses us. He wipes it away. He sets the slate clean. He took all those things that would destroy you and me and He nailed it to the cross. And we're to look to Him, to trust. And we're also trusted with that message as well. To lift up. To encourage. To get the message out. That Jesus Christ gave His life for you and me. And when He rose from the grave, He gave power that we don't have. It's a mystery! trust and be trusted to trust and be trusted with unmerited grace unmerited grace well the last thing that I want to talk about is the mystery of faith that not only is unconditional love unmerited grace but also unending hope unending hope back in 1988 there was a, an earthquake in Armenia one of the worst earthquake disasters that, that we know about. It's estimated 30,000 people died in that earthquake. One of the stories is that a father went to, to his son's elementary school to see if his son was all right. Well, the school was just a pile of rubble. And the father and other parents began to, to pull off rocks, pull off debris. And after eight hours, many of them saw that that there was nothing they could do, but this father never stopped. 16 hours later, he was still pulling off rubble. Strangers began to tell him, can't you see that there's no hope of anybody being alive under there? 32 hours, he was still pulling off rubble. And in the 38th hour, he heard a voice. It was a small voice, and he shouted out, can you hear me? And down the, the shaft in that dark place, came back a voice, Dad, it's me, Aaron. I told the other kids not to worry, that you were alive and you would save me. And when you saved me, you would save them too. Jesus Christ, He never stops searching, seeking, he never stops. No matter what is piled on top of us, no matter what we're, the weight we're crushed beneath, He never stops seeking you and me. That Romans chapter 15 verse 13 says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're living in a time where, where hope is being tested. But know that, that our Savior, Jesus Christ, is still there, still digging, still working for, for, for you and for me with a power, a power, an unending hope that gives strength we don't have. And, and we're to trust, we're to keep our, our eye on Him, to know that He's not stopped, not in any way. And not only are we to trust, but side by side, shoulder to shoulder, we're trusted to encourage, trusted to hold up, trusted to, to share, to share that message, that mystery of hope. This morning, it may be that your hope is damaged. That the emotions you feel, well, it's, it's that same kind of panic maybe you had when you were trying to, to float in the water as a, as a child float on your back. 
that what you know in your head and the hope in your heart, there's a distance between the two of them. The Spirit of God, the God of hope, is alive and well in you. Look to Him, and and I want to pray with you for that hope right now this day. Pray with me. Jesus, move our eyes away from the fear. Move our eyes away from the panic. Lord, give us the strength we don't have to move our eyes to you, our unending hope that never stops seeking, that never stops searching for us, and that we put our trust in you, not only in that unending hope, but puts our trust in you for the unmerited grace and the unconditional love. A trust that though we don't know the danger and though we don't know the destination, we know that you do. But may we not stop there, Lord. We know that that we are trusted. Trusted with that message of unconditional love. Trusted with that message of unmerited grace. Trusted with that message of unending hope. And that side by side, shoulder to shoulder, that you might use us to lift up those around us. We don't have strength enough to do that, but we know that you do. Use us, Lord. Use us, because we're living in a day, in an age, where a world desperately needs to know. Jesus, you are the hope of the world. You are the hope of the world. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, Just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, Thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith, and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online. My hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.